Well, yesterday, the Independent Press Standards Organization was officially launched as the new self-regulatory body for British, newspaper, British newspapers. It succeeds the failed Press Complaints Commission that fell into disrepute after the phone hacking scandal erupted. The anti-hacking group Hacked Off have called Ipso a sham regulator and say they will continue to push for a statutory body closer to that outlined by Lord Justice Levinson, who chaired a major inquiry into the British press in 2012. Nathaniel Amos Sansom has more. Three years after the hacking scandal that shook the world of print journalism to its core, the launch of a new self-regulatory body by the UK's main national newspapers was a low-key affair. But the passions and the criticism that the new independent press standards organisation evokes ensure that the new body has its work cut out for it. Following protests outside of its office as it launched yesterday by the Hacked Off campaign, the head of the new self-regulatory body offered these words. I mean, I say it's really important to listen to them. I say it's really important to understand their anger at the time they've had to wait for independent regulation. And one's got to understand their disappointment. They were promised that what Leveson recommended would happen by the government, not by Ipso, and they are then going to be very understandably suspicious of what we're going to do. Ipso claims that it is the body that is best placed to tackle corruption and wrongdoing in the print industry. However, its offices behind me are the same offices occupied by the Press Complaints Commission, the body that it is replacing. So critics are asking, can this new body be any different? Well, we're looking for new premises and we will move to new premises as soon as we can. So far as the difference, we have radically different powers to those that the former PCC could exercise. We have different powers in relation to adjudicating on complaints. We have different powers in relation to investigation. People who haven't had a voice, who feel oppressed as victims of press abuse can come to us and will be protected by us. While most newspapers have signed up to the new regulatory body, notable exceptions include The Guardian, The Independent and The Financial Times, which is looking to set up its own internal regulator. For Hacked Off, the pressure group representing victims of phone hacking by the news of the world, this new industry regulator lacks the clout to truly enforce the fairness they want. Because it is effectively the same old story of the press setting up an, an organisation which will allow it to mark its own homework, to be its own judge and jury. So that, which, you know, the implication being, of course, that members of the public who have complaints about uh, newspaper coverage, uh, harmful, damaging newspaper coverage, will not get fair treatment under IPSO. The system is there to protect newspaper proprietors and editors, not to protect the public. Amongst all of this is the issue of fair representation, which many members of the Muslim community have raised over the years. I put this to the head of IPSO. Well, I can't discuss specific cases that took place before IPSO started on Monday, but I'm not avoiding the question. It's a really important question, particularly important to your viewers. I quite understand and uh, fear the unnecessary connection between events and the fears of Islamophobia. Leveson heard evidence about Islamophobia and, and expressed concern. If there is a, a question of fairness or a question of imbalance, this is not about the expression of opinions. People, there's nothing in Leveson stopping people expressing opinions, but it about factual um, content and about fairness of treatment of people, those things should be addressed effectively, and that's what Ipso will not and cannot do. Nathaniel Amos Sanson, The Report, Islam Channel. Well, to discuss this, we have Donica DeLong, who's a member of the Executive Committee of the National Union of Journalists. Well, it's called the Independent Organization. Is it independent? No. Um, I think the first factual inaccuracy in the new organization is the first word. It's not inde independent. It was set up by the industry. It's run by the industry and it has failed to meet Leveson's key requirements. But it's chaired by an independent judge. But the PCC previously had an independent chair. Um, it's not independent. It is run, it is funded, it is controlled by the industry that it is supposed to regulate. Um, the NUJ has completely rejected it, so we are not playing any part in it um, because it simply isn't independent. No, but the other alternative, which was recommended by Hacked Off, and we saw Brian Cathcart on the screen, 
requires a royal charter, which many people say is even worse than IPSO. The, well, the royal charter exists. Um, unfortunately, you know, looking back from the NUJ's point of view, we had a similar situation in Ireland. And what happened in Ireland was the industry came together, included the un union in its conversations, came up with a properly independent um, regulator plan, proposed that to the government, and the government put a tiny little bit of statute in place under libel and defamation law to reduce the damages on anyone that was in a, in a body similar to the regulator that had been set up. That regulation is in place in Ireland. That could have happened here. And interestingly, if you look at the newspapers that are involved in that, it includes The Times, The Mirror, and all of the British newspapers that publish in, Ar in Ireland. What happened here instead was a even while Levison was going on, there was a refusal to really discuss proper regulation. So while it was going on and people were going into Levison very contrite in some cases, not in all cases, um, in the background there were attacks on the NUJ for proposing a, a system with, as was pointed out, a minimal of statute because the, the point of the statute in Ireland is actually to reduce the costs for the media. It is completely beneficial. And the problem was then, because the media wouldn't sign up, because the industry wouldn't properly sign up, a deep system was put in place. And yes, Royal Charter was probably the worst way to do it. But realistically, the Royal Charter isn't the problem. It's actually the way that the industry has refused to engage with the process. Well, Alan Moses, the chair that we saw there, the former judge, is saying there will be proper adjudication. If, if somebody has a complaint against the a newspaper and they're not satisfied, then they can go to independent adjudication. I think you'll find if you look back in history, the PCC said exactly the same when it was set up following the collapse of another shamed regulator. This has happened before. We're just seeing history repeating itself once again. The PCC had many more powers than it used. If you look back at the rulings of the PCC over most of its entire history, they only, in the vast majority of cases, ruled on the question of accuracy. But the Editor's Code goes far beyond accuracy and goes into questions of balance and fairness. They refused to adjudicate on those issues. So while it had the power to do so, it refused to do so because it was under the control of the industry and it wasn't in the industry's interest, that part of the industry that's part of IPSO. And I will say the, this is the majority of the industry, as was pointed out in the package. Not all of the national newspapers have signed up to it. But I mean, another point that uh, people who are trying to defend IPSO say is that uh, although uh, it's it, it, individual complainant has to go to a newspaper in the first instance, there can also be third parties. You and I can go along and say, we think there's a major problem with the coverage of the Times on this issue or that issue, Islamophobia or is immigrants or something of that kind, asylum seekers, they're stirring up hatred. We, we are entitled to go to the IPSO and ask for, for, uh, for an adjudication. Well, that, the PCC ultimately in, in the latter years also recognised in very limited cases that um, power. But it's interesting if you look at the complaints, particularly a big case recently where the PCC, I mean, it's probably its last big ruling, found that the Daily Mail had breached its code in relation to the hordes of Bulgarians and Romanians that never appeared at, at the New Year. Um, and an NUJ member had put in a complaint. His first complaint was rejected by the PCC. But once he went back again and again and again, he ultimately forced them to actually adjudicate and find that the story was simply completely inaccurate. Well, doesn't a lot of it depend on the chairperson? I mean, if Alan Moses wants to, in, in the case that you've mentioned, which of course happened before it so was, uh, was created, but something similar were to arise now, he is entitled to demand uh, an inquiry onto that. He can, but I, I'm aware of a number of cases, I've been involved in a number of complaints to the PCC, where the complaints were accepted for adjudication, but the adjudication itself was meaningless. So it's not just about the chair deciding whether or not to adjudicate, it's about the panel that adjudicates. And this is where the big problem comes in, because it will not be an independent panel under IPSO. There is no intention to put together a truly independent panel that brings in one of the NUJ's uh, requirements was that it would have a majority civil society, so not a majority industry. That's not what we're seeing with IPSO. IPSO is, is going to remain an industry-controlled body. Well, I mean, the newspapers that you mentioned that have refused to sign up, like The Guardian and The Independent, they are sort of saying, taking kind of wait-and-see attitude, let's see how they work out in practice. It might be all right if Alan Moses is really tough and so on, and it could have some sort of grow some teeth as it goes along. Do you think that's not a reasonable 
position? I think from their business model, it is a, it's a reasonable um, position. But it will be very interesting because actually one of the changes that was brought in while the Royal Charter was being passed was exemplary damages in libel cases. Um, IPSO does not meet the requirements of the, of the Royal Charter. It does not meet the requirements under law to avoid um, the exemplary damages in libel cases. And it will be very interesting to see, one, whether the government bottles it <laughs> and steps back from that and, and rules actually they give up, or whether we start to see the situation where actually courts start to impose exemplary damages on members of IPSO because IPSO doesn't meet the requirements of Levison. And that could be the bottom line, and when the accountants get involved, that could be the game changer. So, yes, a wait and see um, option is an interesting one. The FTs plan to set up an, their own independent regulator. Well, Levison did say there could be a preponderance of regulators. He didn't say there had to be one. I'm not sure if he meant that there'd be one per newspaper, but it would be interesting to see how that, how that works and whether that could potentially grow into something that the Guardian and the Independent might want to sign up to. Now, what about the issue of Islamophobia? Again, Alan Moses, going back to the video clip that we began with, uh, recognised that that is a very serious issue for people, and particularly, obviously, for Muslim readers of newspapers and viewers of TV and so on. I mean, do you think that uh, you got from his interview the impression that he takes it seriously? Um, I suppose we'll wait and see. Um, he was involved in a charm offence if he was going to say anything that people wanted him to say. However, he didn't actually say anything specific. He said he'd take it seriously. Of course, we saw this week probably one of the most disgracefully Islamophobic front pages on The Sun, where they immediately jump on that horrible beheading in North London. They immediately identified the religion of the person who is accused of, of doing it. We've had no process. It hasn't gone to court. There has been no... Were they even accurate in mentioning the religion? We, we don't know. This is the mm -hmm. point. They jumped immediately on, a, on something that somebody was told, potentially a rumour. It may be accurate. It may not be. It was absolutely inappropriate to plaster on the front page of a newspaper. And this is where, and it's interesting, part of the debate, and it keeps coming up again, is the people saying that if, people are, if the newspapers are committing crimes that they should be tackled through a criminal process, the reality is these are ethical issues. There isn't necessarily a crime in, in relation to bias against Muslims. We don't know. That would have to be tested in the courts. But the reality is ethics is a bigger issue. Ethics is about fairness. It's about accuracy. It's about ensuring that the newspapers actually deal with the people that they're covering fairly. I think we can all acknowledge that that sun front page was not fair and it probably will turn out not to be accurate in the fullest sense of the word because it wasn't based on any evidence. Has somebody complained to Ipso on it? I'm not sure. Um, I'm sure some people will. Um, I'm sure, well, actually, given the timing, they may have already complained to the PCC, um, even though the PCC it was winding up. could be a, the first really important test case. But uh, thank you very much for that, Donica DeLong. Well, that's all we have time for on tonight's programme. Thanks to my guests and to you for tuning in. And remember, you can join in our Twitter conversation on all of tonight's stories by tweeting at Islam Channel and using the hashtag TheReport. We're back tomorrow night, but for now we'll leave you with, with some pictures of North Koreans laying flowers in front of statues of their former leaders, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il, as part of events marking the 66th anniversary of the founding of their nation.